Republicans are finishing it in secret because it is a shameful scheme the American people overwhelmingly oppose. Today, the Senate is going to debate whether to go to conference, to go to conference with the House to resolve the differences between the two plans that the Republicans have passed on a wholly partisan basis. Not a single Democrat in the House, not a single Democrat in the Senate is in support of this bill. And I think it's clear that the conference committee that will meet in the days ahead is nothing more than theater. It is not going to be an honest debate in the light of day. There won't be an honest debate that the American people can listen to on the prospect of $10 trillion worth of tax policy changes that will reach into the corners of every part of this country and every household in America. The truth is, Republicans from the other body in the Senate are hashing out differences right now, right now, behind closed doors. They're packing the bill with even more goodies, even more loopholes for the well-connected and the special interests. There is no telling what swamp creatures have crawled up to Capitol Hill to get their fingers on this bill at the 11th hour. The basic proposition on offer, taking money and health care away from middle class Americans to pay for tax cuts for the multinational corporations and the powerful, the well-connected, that proposition isn't going to change. And now, apparently, the Trump administration is calling for even more speed, even more secrecy, just so that the president can claim a victory and Republicans in Congress can appease mega donors who've made it clear they're frustrated by a sputtering agenda. What unfolded here last week is a black mark on this storied institution, the United States Senate. It was a climax of a process marred by recklessness and partisanship. And this took place, Mr. President, after 17 moderate senators, moderate Democratic senators, tried again last week, while the Senate still had the opportunity to have a bipartisan plan. When I renewed my plan, my ideas, the only two bipartisan federal income tax reform bills in decades written by senior Republicans, the moderate senators and bipartisan plans were discussed yet again last week before the Senate took off on its reckless course. Senators did come to the floor last Wednesday and Thursday prepared for a debate, but it was cut short by the partisan reconciliation process. 20 hours evenly divided between the two sides. But Wednesday turned into Thursday, and there was no final Republican bill. Then Thursday became Friday, and still Republicans had their plan hidden in the shadows. And then late Friday, late Friday, well after dark, I was handed handed personally, a new version of a 500-page bill by the key official in the Republican caucus and said, here, here's the bill. There was no opportunity for review or debate. The majority leader, the distinguished majority leader, had said to me personally during the course of the afternoon when I was asking every 30 minutes, he said, There'll be plenty of time, plenty of time to review the bill. Not only, Mr. President, was there not plenty of time, there was essentially no time. And it reached the point, as we heard from our colleagues last week, that notes on technical material was scribbled into the margins. We had to ask questions about 
education provisions that seem to benefit one academic institution. There are plenty of them that are deserving in Oregon and Pennsylvania. This one seemed to benefit just one. And special interest handouts were airdropped right up, apparently, to the very last minute. Huge giveaways to oil companies and hedge funds. And the unintelligible lines became a metaphor for what this whole debate was all about. Haphazard work that not a school teacher in America, Mr. President, would give a passing grade to if some kind of work product like that was submitted to them. Now, of course, this is what the majority party here, the Senate Republicans, said was a full and honest debate. The technical term here is regular order, but the fact is those $10 trillion of tax changes, $10 trillion of tax changes, were made in secret when the bill that was brought to the floor finally appeared, and it was clear Republicans had played hide the ball with their tax plan until the very last minute. There was not a single hearing on the specifics of the legislation. I heard so many times in the debate, there were 70 hearings. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle, I wish I had a nickel for every time I heard that there were 70 hearings. There was not one single hearing, not one, on the specific provisions of that legislation. No bipartisan input. No member of this body can possibly claim to have read everything before they voted. And now the recklessness continues. Republicans stick with the con job on the middle class as they work out the differences between their two plans, again behind closed doors. Whatever product comes out of these negotiations is still going to raise taxes on millions of middle class Americans and drive a dagger into the heart of the Affordable Care Act. And why? To pay for yet more handouts to faceless multinational corporations. There's still going to be a bigger tax cut to those multinational corporations that ship jobs overseas than there will be for those businesses that create red, white, and blue jobs here at, here at home. What ought to cause even more alarm for Americans over the coming weeks are the special interest goodies that are still being packed in, the handouts nobody yet knows nothing about. Down on K Street, they seem to be licking their chops as they read the bill the Republicans wrote so quickly and carelessly. And it looks to me like a whole flock of tax lawyers are scheming and planning their next moves. According to reports, the big sticking point in the negotiations between Republicans isn't about how you're going to help middle class families or how you're going to protect health care. They're debating whether the corporate handouts ought to get bigger. They're already slashing the corporate rate down to 20 percent. Now they're debating whether corporations should actually be required to pay it. Mr. President, I note that in both of the tax plans I put together that were bipartisan, written with two conservative Republican senators close to the majority leader, during all of those talks, we didn't hear about corporations saying that they had to have a tax rate of 20 percent. Mr. President, the American people do not want this plan to become law. I heard that this past weekend. I had two town meetings in communities where Hillary Clinton had a lot of support and in communities where Donald Trump had a lot of support. And I'm telling you, this tax bill is unpopular all over. It's hard to write a tax bill that's unpopular, but somehow Senate Republicans actually managed to do it. That's what I heard in town halls and when I met with folks Last weekend, in Fred Meyers, our iconic uh, store, uh, we heard it all over. I can promise every member of this body, the American people have a sense of what's coming now. 
The Republican deficit hawks who flew away when the proposition of a $1.5 trillion budget-busting tax bill came up, they're going to come flying back. They'll be flying over the horizon, returning. And there's already a whole lot of frightening Republican talk about the fiscal crisis facing our country, exploding deficits, spending run amok. In fact, Republicans haven't even waited for this tax plan to become law to crack out the fiscal crisis talking points. And we hear all the talk, the president at rallies, talking on national television about entitlement reform. It's a whole lot of focus, tested code for cutting the safety net, the lifeline programs for the vulnerable. Medicaid, Social Security, Medicare, the anti-hunger programs. That sure looks what's next on the slash and burn to-do list. Here in the Congress, the Speaker said a few weeks ago, we've got a lot of work to do in cutting spending. Ways and Means Chairman Brady talked about welfare reform and tackling the entitlements. The Freedom Caucus, the far-right folks in the Freedom Caucus, are using the tax bill to lock in promises on spending cuts in those safety net programs. Nobody knows yet what secret guarantees they've been given. Last week, as Republicans were getting ready to spend a trillion and a half dollars on handouts to corporations, just put your arms around that for a moment, Mr. President. I heard for years in the Finance Committee, in the Budget Committee, about how Republicans want to be fiscally minded and tight with the dollar. Right away, out of the gate, they said, we'll spend a trillion and a half dollars, handouts to corporations. Corporations already awash in money. What we heard is the leadership of the other side of the aisle saying, we're already spending ourselves into bankruptcy. And they were blasting what they called liberal programs for the poor. The chairman of our committee, who I admire greatly, said when it comes to helping the vulnerable, we don't have the money anymore. We don't have the money anymore for the vulnerable, but somehow we can borrow borrow billions of dollars to have a $1.5 trillion handout to multinational corporations awash in money sure indicates to me some out-of-whack priorities. And then we heard our colleague from Pennsylvania, Senator Toomey, say on the floor that there wasn't a secret plan to cut Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security. I give my colleague from Pennsylvania credit for his honesty because he's right about one thing. They're not keeping this tax plan a secret. Republicans are talking about the tax plan and the prospect of these entitlement cuts now in the open. The tax plan may be secret, but the plans for cutting entitlements are going to be right out in the open. Colleagues, I want to close with this. I heard this weekend, I hear every stop I make, that the people of this country do not want this partisan tax plan to become law. They understand what's happening now, the working people and the middle class that are being forced to pay for handouts to multinational corporations. That the plan, the Republican plan, puts the interests of the politically connected above the interests of hardworking American families. And I believe the American people are going to stand up and fight against any fear-mongering attack launched by the so-called deficit hawks, who as they come flying back, are clearly looking at cutting Medicare, Medicaid, anti-hunger, and anti-poverty programs. It's not too late. It's not too late while this process continues between the House and the Senate to change course. Instead of going to a sham conference, a sham conference that is little more than diversionary theater, there could be a real and bipartisan debate on a tax plan that would give every American a chance to get ahead. Mr. President, I've been particularly struck by my conversations with our former colleague, Senator Bill Bradley of New Jersey. He calls 
almost every few days because he, along with President Reagan, were the authors of the last bipartisan plan. And I'm particularly struck by how he describes when Democrats and Republicans came together, Bill Bradley, former Nick, celebrity all over the country, he would fly all over the United States to meet with colleagues like the distinguished president of the Senate from North Carolina. He'd fly all over. Now we can't get Republicans to walk down the corridor of the Dirksen building to have a conversation about how we ought to have a chance to give everybody a good tax plan so that everybody in America can get ahead. That's what I sought to do with Republican colleagues, former Senators Gregg and Coates, plenty conservative. So it is not too late for my Republican colleagues to do an about face and say that we can do better than this. I don't, for the life of me, understand why we can't have Republicans and Democrats on the basis of the overwhelming unpopularity of this bill now say we can do better than this and change course. Mr. President, I yield the floor and I would note the absence of a quorum. Clerk, call the roll.